Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. At the height of last month's winter storm, as the city's water situation worsened, a senior director with CPS Energy sought to keep information about the outages confidential. That revelation comes from emails sent between leadership of the utility and the San Antonio water system, which saw a majority of its large pumping stations impacted by those outages. Dylan Collier with more on some puzzling messages from the energy company. I left all my pipes running like I was supposed to, like we were all advised. But the winter blast on February 15th proved to be too much for Megan Rivera's Leon Valley apartment. Water poured through a bathroom ceiling, leaving behind chunks of sheetrock as the second floor unit sat in five inches of water for nearly a week. It's a lot. I'm like on the edge of a mental breakdown. Hold on to water service as long as they could. SAW's Chief Operating Officer Stephen Klaus last week told its trustees communication between the water and sewage utility and the power company was continuous as a majority of SAW's large primary and booster pump stations were impacted by power brownouts during the storm. But this email sent by CPS Senior Director Clayton Crucey February 17th raises questions. While providing a SAWS Vice President a status update on power to its pump stations, Crucey wrote, confidential please. The VP, Jeff Habe, responded that he had shared the information with only his control center management team. SAWS officials this week directed our inquiries about the email exchange to CPS, which refused to make Crucey or President and CEO Paula Gold Williams available for an interview. A spokeswoman instead said the information shared by Crucey had circuit and account numbers and cited growing security concerns for both water and energy infrastructure as the reason for wanting it kept confidential. The emails also show even after CPS publicly announced that rotating outages were underway at 2.55 a.m. Monday, the utility repeatedly continued to ask SAW's leadership to voluntarily conserve energy. Just 90 minutes after Crucey's confidential pleas email, SAWS was forced to issue a citywide boil water notice. And Rivera's renter's insurance policy will keep her and her son in a hotel, but only until tomorrow. After that, she is on her own. Also, just a note about transparency. We have now been looking into CPS Energy's handling of the deadly winter storm for just shy of a month. Other than answering a handful of questions during media briefings, the utility has not made anyone from its senior leadership team available for an interview with our investigative unit. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. Not only are some seniors having trouble signing up online for their COVID vaccine, many also have a language barrier. They're primarily Spanish speakers. Phone lines to register have bilingual operators and websites have a Spanish language option, yet some users have said they can't find the translation on their cell phones. To try to make it easier for Spanish speakers to find, a San Antonio City Council member says she believes there should be a more uniform way to reach them. I think that we really need to get together ASAP and figure out what that solution is for our Spanish speaking audiences. Councilwoman Rocha Garcia says the subject will likely come up next week when vaccine providers meet with the city's Community Health and Equity Committee. We've been told by both University Health and Metro Health that improvements are now in the works for their Spanish language websites. A lot has changed for senior living facilities since this pandemic began. People living in those facilities and their families all had to adjust. But even though Texas is fully open again and masks are no longer mandated by the state, one local senior living community tells us they are not taking any chances. Tiffany Huertas has a look now at how Morningside Ministries is making it possible for families to see their loved ones. Go see him. I'm having that weekly COVID test, but I wear an N95. Today was a great day. Sandy Salone was able to see her father, who is currently at Morningside Ministries, a senior living community. We have a great time together. But it wasn't always like this. Pandemic hit, we just went into lockdown. And at that point, from one day to the next, I was not able to see him in person. Salone says in the summer, she was able to do outdoor visitations. They started the essential caregiver program. I was actually able to go to his room and visit him in person. Essential caregivers are the only ones who can visit their loved ones inside the facility. Everyone else can schedule a masked visit outside or through a window. Um, it's very important for our residents to still make connections with their loved ones, but we do have to be responsible in how we make those connections. 
Um, our, our families have to make appointments. They have to get COVID tested. They have to make sure they're wearing a mask. Munoz says a year ago, there was a lot of unknown that brought anxiety and stress. But today, there was a lot of um, anxiety. There was a lot of stress. There was a lot of unknown. But now that we have vaccines in arms, now that we know more about COVID, uh, we're better prepared to um, fight back against it. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. A year-long ban on in-person prisoner visits with inmates in the Texas prison system set to be lifted next week as part of the governor's reopen, reopen Texas orders. All visits were halted last spring due to the pandemic. Paul Venema with the visitation guidelines and whether in-person jail visits will resume here at the Bear County Jail. In advance of resuming in-person visits next Monday, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice has released these video guidelines for families. Visits must be scheduled in advance. Only two visits per month and only one adult may visit at a time. I asked Sheriff Javier Salazar if he's considering making similar changes at the Bear County Jail. The short answer, no. We haven't really done any in-person visits in several years. The sheriff said those visits were difficult and required waiting in long lines. It would take a long time. It was very inconvenient for family, uh, but this video system seems to work out much, much better. He's talking about a video visit system that was set up here at the jail during the pandemic. We enabled the system to, to, to allow at-home uh, visits from families of, of inmates uh, to be able to do it from the comfort of their home. And so that's been very, very successful. Salazar said that during the pandemic, they've also provided just over 660,000 free phone calls for inmates. The sheriff said though the COVID numbers among inmates are improving, he's concerned about the governor's move to open up the state. It's created some problems. Obviously, we're going to roll with the punches. We're going to do whatever we need to do. Uh, but in, in my opinion, it was a bit early to start relaxing things. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at the trans guide camera out there right now. Loop 410 at Starcrest. We're actually looking at, oh, the view just changed here. <laughs> Loop 410 at Evers now. Wanted to tell you about that accident, though, that was near 410 and Starcrest. It was on the on-ramp looking uh, back towards Nacogdoches. In this view, 410 at Evers, you can see it looks like two vehicles off to the side there. Uh, some people standing around those vehicles. Hopefully they get the help they need, but traffic not slowing down because of it, it looks like at this point. We have learned a lot about how to do things at an arm's length, and medicine is no exception, even when treating COVID-19 itself. Doctors have been struggling with the best ways to treat patients showing COVID symptoms, but who don't require hospitalization. Ursula Perry shows us how some hospitals are perfecting the full-service COVID clinic, but at home. This is Michael Aretta's new normal. He's one of millions of Americans whose life has drastically been changed by COVID-19. Everybody in the apartment had it. Uh, everybody got over it, except for me. I'm what you call a long hauler. Michael became sick in August. Shortly afterward, he was hospitalized and intubated. It was very traumatic. Fortunately, his condition improved, but that meant he faced recovery from a deadly disease in his own home. They are infectious uh, and can't go to their home clinics for care. We just didn't have a way of caring for these patients who were not in the hospital. We follow the patients through the acute infection phase. One person on the team was taking care of my medication. One person was taking care of me physically. Another person would be taking care of me mentally. We're following their oxygen saturation level. We're following their temperature. We're following their symptoms. It kept me busy. You know, I was always either on the phone or somebody was at my door. Michael is now steadily getting better and feeling stronger. The COVID-19 Comprehensive Care Clinic in Santa Clara has been open since August. It sees about 60 patients a day through telemedicine. Here in San Antonio, University Health has a similar clinic for post-COVID care. While many of the patients do go to the clinic in person, they also do telemedicine. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam on this Thursday. More clouds, still Ooh. the same. <laughs> yeah, that's not a pretty view. <laughs> not at all.
No, the wind I still remains. I was hoping we'd see a few more peaks of sun today. There has been a lot of sun off to the southwest, and that's where temperatures have been allowed to jump into the upper 80s this afternoon. And yeah, that wind's still a nuisance today. Today's Almanac 66, our morning low. That's 16 degrees above average for this time of year, and it looks like we topped out just shy of 80 at the airport in San Antonio this afternoon. It's warm out there, still breezy. Our sustained winds are still between about 10 and 20 miles per hour right off the Gulf of Mexico, so the humidity just continues continues to roll in this evening. So staying breezy over the next several hours. Cloud cover, if you've got a little clearing late this afternoon, that cloud cover will gradually build back in tonight and it'll be overcast by 11 p.m. Midnight wind gusts 30 to 25 miles per hour possible over the next few hours. Cloud cover continues to move in from the south and from the west. And here is what we're waiting on. This is our storm system that arrives this weekend to bring us a few rumbles of thunder late on Saturday. We'll talk about the storm system in the upcoming weekend coming up later in the newscast. Just about time now for an update on COVID cases in our community. The numbers have been encouraging lately. Case numbers going down while the number of vaccinations continues to rise by the day. Positivity rate also back down to 2.6%, the best that we've seen since they've been tracking all of this. Let's listen in to see where the numbers are today. Commissioner Justin Rodriguez, we're joined tonight by Dr. Junda Wu, who's our Bear County Public Health Authority. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 366 new cases of COVID-19, which brings a total to 199,461. Our seven-day rolling average is now at 186. Unfortunately, today we do have five new deaths to report that occurred within the last 14 days. We have now lost 2,861 of our neighbors, friends, and family members to COVID-19. So please remember to keep their families and survivors in your prayers this evening. We are continuing to see more improvements in our local hospitals. Um, the census is down 10 from yesterday, so there are 240 COVID-19 patients in local hospitals tonight. That again remains the lowest number as it continues to tick down since we've uh, seen uh, the surge in early November. There were 42 admissions in the last 24 hours. 104 patients are in the ICU this evening and 63 are on ventilators. With numbers going in the right direction, again, we'll say this every night as we continue to get towards the end of this pandemic, hopefully sooner than later, and we continue to get vaccines out. Please do not let your guard down. Continue to protect your, your neighbors and family members from this virus. As of yesterday, a quick update on vaccines. In Bear County, we have now administered 319,011 uh, to people who have had their received their first dose. And now 184,348 people are fully vaccinated uh, here in Bear County with the vaccine. So let's continue to wear our masks, practice social distancing as we work to get more people vaccinated. And uh, we will continue to get closer uh, to um, seeing uh, some of that life return to normal again. So let me turn it now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, yeah, I think I think the good news is the, the numbers are looking better. Uh, I think we can say they are trending certainly in the right direction, particularly with respect to the hospital numbers. So that is good news for our community. Um, let's keep that up. Uh, vaccinations, I know that everybody is practicing their best uh, patience with respect to vaccinations. I, I know we're going to hear later this evening the president's going to make some remarks with respect to uh, all folks being eligible uh, as soon as May 1. Um, I know we are all anxious here to make sure that everybody's vaccinated. So um, I think he's going to have some additional comments with respect to mobile uh, vaccination sites and some uh, some other large uh, sites in our community. Um, so uh, we'll, we're all waiting uh, to see what the president has to say about that. But certainly vaccinations is number one on everybody's list. And, and um, I think with particularly with respect to the, the Johnson and Johnson coming out, we're going to have more in our community, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, just a quick word on the Bear County uh, Plumbing Assistance Program. Um, as of actually through today, uh, about 200 folks have, have uh, inquired about plumbing assistance, pipe repair. This goes back, to, of course, to the uh, the freeze those few days. Um, we've helped about uh, a little over 150 folks, 160 actually, uh, with plumbing assistance through Bear County's plumbing assistance program. This is again for folks who live in the unincorporated areas and the suburban cities. If you still need assistance, we have assistance there. Um, and it, this is kind of a supplemental program to the SAWS uh, program, but just go to bear.org slash pipes, or you can call 210 631 
thousand. And of course, I joined the mayor in asking everybody, particularly now we're in a new um, phase with the, the governor's announcement, but I'm, I'm very proud of folks who uh, have stepped up and said they're going to continue to ask people to mask up small businesses, restaurants, bars, um, and we need to continue that vigilance. So um, let's keep it up. Thanks, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And I do want to say a special thank you again to all those business owners who are doing what they need to do to protect themselves, uh, their employees, their staff, as well as their customers. Continue to mask up. I uh, also want to remind you that the city and the county are working together to make sure that people can keep a roof over their head. If you are having trouble paying the rent or mortgage through this crisis, please access our emergency housing assistance program by calling 311. You can also get more information at covid19.sanantonio.gov. All right, an increase in the number of new cases reported today. We saw fewer than 100 yesterday, but today 366 new cases of COVID-19 confirmed in our community. Five new deaths reported by the mayor. The hospitalization numbers, those continue to decrease. 240 people hospitalized, and that seven-day rolling average now sits at 186 cases reported on average per 24 hours. Meanwhile, we're continuing to see more and more people get vaccinated. Uh, the mayor announcing 319,011 people have had their first dose now. 184,348 now fully vaccinated. We're expecting to hear more about the vaccine rollout across the nation tonight at seven o'clock when President Biden addresses the nation about his recovery plan and marking the one year since uh, this was all declared a pandemic. So more to come on that. Yeah, absolutely. And we're expecting to hear him say that he's directing states to uh, make the vaccine available to all adults uh, come May 1st so that you can hear that address right here after this newscast. All right, let's turn to the weather out there right now. It is another spring like day. Katie Blake definitely and this is going to continue into the end of the work week tomorrow. So don't expect a whole lot of change Friday and for most of Saturday. Now late Saturday, that's when our rain chances and our storm chances will start to creep up just a bit. And again, it's all thanks to this storm system that's spinning over the western portion of the U.S., bringing some rain to places like Southern California, Arizona, and some snow to the higher elevations of uh, Nevada and Utah there. So this low is going to slowly creep east as we get into tomorrow and first half of the day on Saturday. This is the same system, and you've probably seen some of this on social media, that's going to dump several feet of snow across portions of Colorado. Some more rain expected up in the plains as well, but this low will drag a front across Texas late Saturday. So we are expecting some showers and even some thunderstorms to develop along this cold front as it moves through late Saturday night into the early morning hours of Sunday. There certainly could be a couple of stronger storms embedded within this line, but any concern for a lot of severe weather is going to be way up in North Texas and the uh, central plains there. But we could have some gusty winds and certainly some rumbles of thunder and I think that's mainly problematic because that's when we lose an hour of sleep Saturday night. So not overly concerned about severe weather, but certainly some scattered thunder showers possible late Saturday. By the time we get to Sunday, that front will be clearing the area. We'll see some sunshine Sunday afternoon. Humidity will drop great into the weekend on Sunday, but we've got to get through that front sweeping through late Saturday first and another pretty warm and muggy day tomorrow. Cloudy in the morning few peaks of sun possible tomorrow afternoon with a high around 82 front sweeps through late Saturday by Sunday afternoon. We are sitting pretty sunny 75 and low humidity. So my pick for the upcoming weekend definitely going to be Sunday guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, the Spurs did not get the win last night, but DeMar DeRozan had a pretty good game. Yeah, DeMar DeRozan leads the Spurs this season in points per game and assists per game. And after the game last night, Pop called him the glue, but unfortunately, the glue will not be with the Spurs tomorrow night. And a local boxer sees his Olympic dream put on hold. Coming up. This season, the Spurs lost when DeMar DeRozan scored at least 30 points. They were 5-0 and before last night when he scored 30 or more. DeMar dropped 32 on the Mavs to go with 11 rebounds, but the Spurs lost 115-104. to DeMar is clearly the Spurs' big dog. Well, he is the glue. <laughs> That's why he seems like it. Uh, we'd be in big trouble without him, you know, being our anchor. And, you know, and it's mostly because, obviously, he's talented, but he's willing to pass the ball. And he makes a lot of things happen for a lot of people. 
Before the game, Pop announced that the Spurs and LaMarcus Aldridge agreed to part ways after nearly six full seasons with the silver and black. You know, being one of the leaders on this team, we have to move forward. But, you know, LaMarcus, you know, you can't forget what he's done here. He's not just my teammate. He's my friend. I've known him since I was 16 years old. So, um, you know, obviously I'm wishing the best for him. But this is us. This is us now. Rudy and the Spurs will host the Orlando Magic tomorrow night at 8. DeMar is out for personal reasons. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans head coach David Coley met with the media today, and the hot topic, of course, was starting quarterback Deshaun Watson. The four-year pro is reportedly completely done with the Texans. Entering his first season as a head coach, Coley was asked, would he try to change Watson's mind to keep him in Houston? Well, it's not a matter of me trying to change anybody's mind. As I said before, right now we're committed to him. Uh, he's a Houston Texan, and uh, uh, we're going to move forward with that. But, but if, he, if he doesn't want to be a Houston Texan, how does this situation get resolved? Uh, I, I don't know about him not wanting to be a Houston Texan, but what I hear from the outside, uh, I just know that he's a Houston Texan. He's ours. We're committed to him, and we're going to go with that. And you got to feel for Coley. He's been put in a tough spot. Also, wide receiver Brandon Cooks restructured his contract, freeing up more than $6 million in salary cap. San Antonio boxer Vincent Ciordia was getting ready to fight in the upcoming summer games, but that's been put on hold, and it's not the first time for him. Vincent received a call to try out for the Philippine Olympic team back in December 2019. He went to the Philippines to audition by fighting another member of the squad, and he made the national team. But the 2020 summer games were postponed to this summer because of the coronavirus. No problem. He would continue to train at Luna Boxing Facility right here in town, but the Olympic qualifiers were recently canceled, so it forced the IOC to only choose fighters with international experience, meaning Vincent isn't eligible. Yeah, it's, obviously I was very disappointed and um, you know heartbroken because something that you've worked for your whole life, uh, it's kind of just taken away, not even like th through a fight, just by a board decision. But I do understand uh, COVID, you know, has you know affected most of the world, and there's a lot of things bigger than boxing right now. And um, there's de def definitely plenty more tournaments I can take part in, and uh, there's definitely more for my boxing career right now. Vincent said he hopes to rep the Philippines in the 2024 Summer Games, and he'll represent them in other tournaments in the meantime. Now, in case you're wondering, his mom is from the Philippines, his dad from San Antonio, and Vincent was born and raised in the Philippines until the age of four. Congratulations to the Holy Cross cheerleaders, your 14-time NCAA national champions. They wrapped up title number 14 this past weekend in Fort Worth. They also won superior showmanship best use of stunts, and three were named NCAA All-American cheerleaders. Thank you to Jennifer Lopez for sending us the pics and information. Her daughter's on the squad. And for other area teams crowned NCAA national champs, please send us your pictures, and I'll be happy to show them off. Guys? That's awesome. Congrats to them. Yep. Yeah, they're good at being the champs. Yep, <laughs> they are, right? <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You got it. Our case on Q&A is up next. Every week, we take your biggest COVID-19 questions straight to her. And we're happy again to have Dr. Ruth Bergren with us this evening, infectious disease doctor with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Huge focus still on vaccines. And we're getting a lot of questions about what kind of vaccine someone should get if they have the option, uh, depending on what their own physical conditions may be. So how should people make that decision? I would still say that the best vaccine for you to get is the one that's available to you right now. Um, that is the top priority is get the vaccine into your arm. Um, a consideration is that if you have uh, problems with transportation, problems getting to the vaccine site, it's a hassle, you may want to opt for the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson, which is a one and done shot. So if you um, need to have that as a major consideration, maybe you would be a good candidate for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But they all continue to be 100% effective at the most important outcome, which is preventing very serious illness that require hospitalization and, and, and that prevent death. So they all prevent death. It is true that the J&J &J vaccine, which was tested in different populations at a different time point, is less effective at preventing mild disease than the Pfizer and the Moderna. But the most important thing is that they all protect against death. 
I know we're still learning a lot about these vaccines as more and more Americans are getting them. I've been reading some articles this week that seem to suggest women are having more adverse uh, reactions to some of the vaccines. Is that common in just all vaccines and women having more severe impacts or is that specific to the COVID shots? It is common for all vaccines, but it's striking data. And so the COVID vaccination, uh, the attention that we're paying to COVID vaccines has kind of brought this out. Um, it is it is the a fact that all of the anaphylactic reactions, 19 out of 19 anaphylactic reactions reported from Moderna were in women, and something like 44 out of 47 of the anaphylactic reactions to the Pfizer vaccine were reported in women. Now, if you look across the board at anaphylactic reactions in the United States over, say, a five-year period, what you find is that 80% of the people reporting anaphylaxis are women. So this is not specific to the COVID vaccine. And you could say, well, why is that? And it turns out that actually women have a more robust immune response to vaccines um, in general than men do. And it is probably hormonally mediated, Tim. Oh, that is so interesting. I did not know that. Um, let's get to some viewer questions here. We've gotten a lot actually focused on this very topic. Uh, someone writes that they've read it's not advised to take an NSAID before and after receiving the vaccine for how long. They say they take a prescription meloxicam to help with severe hip, hip pain. And could that interfere with the effectiveness of the vaccine? So here's the deal. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the family of ibuprofen. Um, and while it's true that uh, for a long time studies have shown that immune responses to vaccines are blunted by taking these, um, these drugs, it's not clear that the blunting of the antibody response actually results in something clinically meaningful like having it be less effective for you. So the bottom line is, it's not a great idea if you don't have to be taking the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, it's not a great idea to be taking it. And you should go and get your vaccine, and if you're experiencing high fever or some sort of severe side effect, then you may wanna start with acetaminophen, and if that's not adequate or you can't take acetaminophen, you might wanna go with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory after that. For somebody with really severe hip pain, um, you would probably be best advised to consult with your doctor about whether there are some interim strategies that you can take. But you, in any event, the withholding of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory does not have to be for a long period of time. And we have no clinical evidence that it's going to prevent you from getting a, a protective immune response to the COVID vaccine. There simply is no clinical evidence of that. Another question we frequently are seeing from viewers are those who have had COVID and they want to know how long should they be waiting before they get in line for the vaccine? And is there anything that could happen if they go too soon after having uh, tested positive for COVID? Right. So this answer is not set in stone, but there are a couple of guideposts that we can be pretty confident of. First off, don't go get the vaccine if you're sick. If you, are, if you have recently been diagnosed with COVID, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, you need to isolate for that 10-day period plus 24 hours of no fever before you can go get vaccinated because we don't want you in, uh, actively infectious people standing in line and going to get COVID vaccine. So that is the minimum period that you have to wait. Now, how long is it safe to wait? We need to pay close attention to the fact that people in South Africa, people in Brazil are getting reinfected. So people had natural infection, they got over it, they waited a period of time, and then they got sick again because their immune system wasn't protecting them against these mutant viruses. We know the mutants are circulating here in Texas, so that could happen as well. So the, the longest duration that people feel comfortable, and I say people, I mean medical experts, uh, the longest period that medical experts feel really comfortable telling people they can wait is about 90 days. Your own immunity is probably robust in the first few months after your infection, and then it starts to dwindle. So uh, you, you, you wanna wait at least 10 days after your infection till you're no longer infectious. You could get vaccinated, then nothing bad's going to happen to you. But you could also wait 90 days after your infection 
because your your antibody levels are going to be very high during that period and will probably give you reasonable protection in the interim. Yeah, so a couple of things to consider there. Of course, we've got more questions we want to ask you, but we are out of time. But we will see you again next week. Dr. Ruth Bergren, thanks so much, as always, for being here. Good to be with you. We'll be right back. The people in charge at YouTube say they're doing their best to fight coronavirus vaccine misinformation. According to The Hill, the streaming site has taken down more than 30,000 videos since October. And that is just a small fraction of the videos YouTube has removed in just the past year. Since February 2020, more than 800,000 videos have been removed for general coronavirus misinformation. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. It has not been a good view from this it, live cam through, <laughs> throughout I, I the last I hour. To smack that, get it back into focus. I know, it's out of focus. I mean, it's still not necessarily beautiful um, out there this evening because of all the clouds, the humidity, and the wind has been a bit of a bother. So feeling very spring-like out there for the past several days. Check out our almanac if you missed it earlier. 66 our morning low. Our average low temperatures this time of year are closer to 50 degrees, so much warmer than average. And this afternoon, not too bad, 79. Uh, we weren't able to creep into the low 80s because of the clouds. Now, we should, still should keep a lot of clouds around tomorrow. Look for a high temperature, upper 70s, low 80s, and yes, windy conditions continue into Friday. Storm chances, those don't kick in until late Saturday. Another look at your weekend forecast coming up. In the buzz today, The Queen's Gambit is headed to the stage as a musical. The Netflix show about a female chess prodigy is based on Walter Tevis's 1983 novel of the same name. The production company Level Forward has acquired the stage rights to that book. And the story follows orphan Beth Harmon as she navigates the world of chess and drug addiction. In its first month on Netflix, the show had more than 62 million viewers. It's already won two Golden Globes and two Critics' Choice Awards. Level Forward has previously produced Jagged Little Pill and Revival, The Revival of Oklahoma. Did you watch Queen's Gambit? I have not, so I don't know if it'd be a good musical or not, but everything <laughs> sounds better with I can't see it as a songs, musical, right? but it was a good show. <laughs> well, who hasn't thought about getting their own private island? There's another going up for auction. Little Ragged Island in the Bahamas, also known as St. Andrews, is for sale. In addition to freshwater ponds and sailing opportunities, the 750-acre island has its own flamingos. There should be a lot for whatever the price tag for this is. Yeah. The nearest neighbor would be about 10 minutes away by boat. That sounds enticing. <laughs> uh, to even join the auction, though, you need a $100,000 deposit. Concierge Auctions, a U.S. real estate company, says the island is listed for $19.5 million, ah. but there is no minimum bid. Bidding opens March 26th, if you're interested, and closes March 31st. A number of island brokers have reported a huge spike in demand for private islands since the pandemic started. 19 million. Yeah. Get you a lot of flamingos. <laughs> Johnny Appleseed is such a part of American lore that he has two days devoted to him on the national calendar. One of those days is today. National Johnny Appleseed Day is March 11th because it's planting season. Now, he may seem like a made up character, but he was a real guy. John Chapman was born 1774 walked across the country, often barefoot, planting trees and pears. Spent a lot of time in my home state of Ohio. Lots of things named after <laughs> Mr. Appleseed. As the story goes, those apples he planted were too bitter to eat, but they were good for apple cider, a safe alternative to drinking water on the frontier. So you don't necessarily need to eat an apple to honor Johnny Appleseed on either one of his national days. A glass of cider works just fine. By the way, the other day he is celebrated would be his birthday, which is September 26th. Lots of history about him and the area where I grew up. I feel like you could tell us a lot about Johnny Apple. <laughs> it was part of Ohio history for some point. Ah, okay. That's cool. But yeah. I still remember is... it. <laughs> All right. So outside today, Katie, eh, spring like, but you know, not, it would be, not, not too pretty. Yeah. In some aspects. Not a lot be, of sun. Yeah. It would be nice to get a little bit of sun going, that's for sure. Uh, but still warm. I mean, we had some spots even that hung on to some cloud cover. Climb into the low to mid 80s this afternoon. I wanted to show you 
they fixed the camera for us. That's a better view. Much more in focus, yes, yes, but nonetheless, still showing us plenty of cloud cover. Reading overcast at the airport, 76, a dew point in the low 60s. So while it has gotten muggy over the past few days, at least we've had the breeze in place. That kind of keeps things moving around just a bit, but I know those gusty winds can be a bit of a nuisance. So it's been feeling a lot like spring so far this week, but the official start of spring, the spring equinox, is still nine days away on a Saturday, March 20th. So still a ways to go there until spring officially keeps kicks in and we're going to keep the spring like feel around for a couple more days Friday into Saturday. Look at our morning lows still closer to 70 as we get into the start of the weekend staying warm into the afternoons as well. But by Sunday morning, especially by Monday morning, it'll be a little bit cooler out there behind a cold front that moves through on Saturday night that helps us out with rain too. And we'll take a look at that coming up. High temperatures across the area today. Our average in San Antonio is right around 72. We were up to 79, 75 the high in Rock Springs, 88 in Carrizo Springs, but some low 90s down to the south where there was just a little more sunshine. Right now we've got 70s for most of us, but still in the mid to upper 80s off to the southwest. 74 Gonzales, 72 in Kerrville. The breeze is still in place right off the Gulf of Mexico, around 10 to 20 miles per hour, uh, but our wind gusts have started to come down. They were up there again today, late this morning, early this afternoon, up closer to 30, 35 miles per hour at times. Now much more relaxed, but Gusts will continue to be elevated for the next couple of days. So this is looking at the next four days or so. Friday into Saturday, wind gusts will still be up as high as 30, 35 miles per hour at times. As we get into Sunday and early next week, it will definitely not be quite as windy. Still a little bit breezy, but not quite as gusty once we get to Sunday and into Monday of next week. So we've got a lot of moisture streaming in from the southwest here. We're seeing that uh, in the form of some of that high cloud cover that's really off to the west of 35. But this is our storm system producing some precip over the southwestern United States. You can really see this beautifully, the counterclockwise spin and this upper level low pressure system there as we look at water vapor imagery. So that is our next low and it is going to be moving east during the day tomorrow, but still far enough to our west that it won't really start to impact our weather tomorrow and for much of the day Saturday. Now by late Saturday, that storm system will bring a cold front across Texas. There could be some strong to severe storms, mainly up to our north. Um, as we get into late Sunday evening, this is expected to move through San Antonio sometime after midnight. I think by tomorrow we'll really be able to nail down hour by hour for you with this front moving through because as the front arrives, we'll get a line of some showers and some scattered storms. As we get into early Sunday, this clears off to the east and then we'll be left with plenty of sun by Sunday afternoon. So it's really just Saturday night that we've got a chance of rain. As far as any severe weather, it's really not a concern. We are at the lowest end of our severe risk scale here, a one out of one to five for places like Brackettville and Kenny County, Del Rio, up to the western portion of the hill country. I can't rule out a couple of stronger storms there late Saturday evening, but really this is not a severe weather issue for us. Hopefully we'll just get a nice um, line of some showers to help us out a little bit with rainfall and then beautiful on Sunday. Tomorrow, 67 to start your day. Breezy winds becoming gusty again at times tomorrow up to 35 miles per hour. High temperatures back in the low 80s. Still warm and muggy for most of Saturday. Front comes through Saturday night and by Sunday afternoon, not only will it be sunny, but humidity will drop in a really nice way by Sunday afternoon too. Guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Hi, good morning. It is Thursday, March 11th. Thanks for joining us today. CVS announcing that they will be opening more vaccination sites in Texas. 74 new sites to be specific. Stores are going to be getting doses starting on Saturday, and they're going to be making appointments available when they get them. The vaccines will be available to all those eligible residents in phases 1A and 1B. But then starting on Monday, the vaccine will also be available to those in phase 1C. Today, the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified the man as 25-year-old Khalid Valencia. 24-year-old Jovan Cruz was also killed in the crash. Police say Valencia and Cruz were speeding on Hausman Road around 2 o'clock yesterday morning. Investigators tell us their car hit a barrier, lifted off the ground, and hit a median on the main lanes of I-10, killing them both. In the last year, there have now been 29.3 million cases of COVID-19 here in the United States. 
with uh, millions of them here in Texas, and 530,000 Americans have now died. Yeah, due to COVID-19, SeaWorld has been open on a limited basis and will continue those safety protocols. You have to make reservations online. When you arrive, there will be a temperature check. You need to wear a mask. Sanitizing stations are all over the park. And if you want to make some waves at Aquatica, they are also ready to make sure you have some fun in the pool and on the slides in a safe and social distancing way. And a warning from mom and dad, the water's cold, the kids won't care, but you might. All right, so tomorrow will be very similar to today. It's this weekend that changes arrive. Front comes in late Saturday night with a chance of some scattered showers and storms. The thunder you hear Saturday night may be problematic because that's when we lose an hour of sleep, so not great timing there. But we do clear out beautifully for Sunday. Don't forget with this time change, our sunrise is going to be an hour later, but so will our sunset by Sunday. Sunset will be at 741. Guys. Maybe that thunder will be the reminder to move the clock forward. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I'm thankful for the iPhone. Thank you so much for doing that automatically. <laughs> all right, the presidential address is coming up next. We'll be on for the night beat later tonight after all the programs air in their entirety. We'll see you then.